As ML systems have become larger and larger, so too have their carbon emissions. I spoke with Sasha Lucioni, a research lead at Hugging Face, who has thought a lot about how models of different capabilities and sizes impact the climate, and how to measure their impacts. We also got into some of her other work, including a really interesting paper on meta-ethical perspectives on AI ethics. This is The Gradient Podcast. I'm Daniel Bashir. The best way you can help me out with this project is by sharing it with people you know, and by leaving ratings and feedback. And now, without further ado, Sasha Lucioni. So, Sasha, I've been following your work on climate and a lot of other things you're working on. You've done some really important work characterizing things like bias and systems like stable diffusion. And I want to begin maybe by by understanding what led you to want to start working on some of these topics. I think that, uh, so I, I, um, I have a PhD in AI and education, and I always kind of cared about the the societal aspects of things. When when I started doing my PhD, I realized that no matter what technical approaches I proposed, that it would have a pretty significant um, human impact, right? And then um, as I started working in, in applied research, I realized that actually it's any kind of AI tool or approach, because it's, it's kind of either takes data from from society or, or or you know predicts things into society that like you can't really go uh, um, you can't really avoid having these societal impacts and so that's what when I really started getting interested in okay what well, this is like the technical side but what happens when the technical meets the the human or, or meets the you know the broader application side of things I remember seeing a lot of this when I was just getting into AI back kind of in college and I feel like it was it was a really interesting time because we had seen a lot of really important work coming out from people like Dr. Timothy Jabru, for example. And I, I feel like there was a lot of, it was like a, a weird time for big tech. So I feel like a lot of people were very aware of this. But I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, when you started to think about, I feel like this has a lot of social impacts, and that's something I want to work on. Were there kind of personal societal things that were sort of going on that flowed into that story for you? Uh, I don't think there was a specific societal event or anything, but I, I, all through like my, my studies and, and even before I started doing AI, I was, I was really always interested in like where technical meets like societal or socio-technical. So I actually started out in linguistics and even there I was trying to understand like, how does language evolve? How do, I don't know, how does rumor, how do rumors propagate in society? I remember we covered stuff like this and it was always like that, that interest of mine. And I, I, you know, I love the technical side. I love the coding. I love the the doing research. But at the end of the day, it's like I really want to understand how research impacts the world. Yeah, I, I think um maybe this is a good segue then into beginning to talk about some of your work on climate change. And you've been leading a lot of AI and climate work at Hugging Face. And there, there's a few different details of the work I want to talk about. But maybe to begin with, I have a a pretty high level question. One of the really important things about your work is looking at characterizing how can we how can we sort of measure the impacts of different systems? What are some concrete steps we can take in order to mitigate those kinds of impacts that we really don't want to see? And at the same time that you're doing this work, we're getting thrown. I mean, I think, yes, very, very recently, we've seen things like Gemini Ultra and and OpenAI coming out with a new text to video model. And I think one thing that will come up in one of your papers later is how text to image models have a very high carbon emissions compared to other tasks. And so the, the trends are, are kind of hard. And I feel like one thing that a lot of people who come at the climate problem from different angles also kind of deal with is how do we how do we tell the story? How do we communicate things to people in a way that actually incentivizes, generates action? And I guess I'm wondering if I can ask you a little bit about when it comes to this work, how do you think about the kind of theory of change aspect? Like what kind of impact do you hope that the work is going to have. That's actually a great question, and and some. So I really started in the in the climate positive side of things, and so actually I had um what I call my quarter life crisis. I was working I was working at Morgan Stanley. Uh, <laughs> I applied to a bunch of postdocs, didn't get any of them. Ended up at Morgan Stanley, and it was actually really interesting. Like I I definitely learned a lot uh, about finance and about kind of like applied AI research, and I was actually pretty happy. But at a certain moment I realized that kind of my 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 social convictions uh, in terms of like justice and climate change didn't really correspond to my day-to-day job and 
I really had like a crisis, like an identity crisis. And I was going to quit my job and go teach kids how to, you know, I don't know, compost or plant trees or whatever. And my partner was really like, well, well, maybe like you you did all these studies and got a PhD. Maybe you can actually like use that somehow. (laughs) And then I ended up finding um, a bunch of people who kind of had the same uh, type of idea as I did uh, of, of really using these like technical AI skills in the fight against climate change. And we wrote this paper. This was uh, back in like 2018, uh, tackling climate change with machine learning. And um, and then we created climate change AI around it. And, and it became like a whole community. And it's still uh, it's like it's still growing and people are joining and we're, we have events and, and workshops. And then um, when Emma Strubel uh, uh, published and her colleagues published this first paper about the carbon footprint of machine learning in um, I think it was 2019, like, I remember people emailing me being like, well, actually, maybe you like are actually doing more harm than good with your work. Uh, and, and I had kind of this intuition of, I don't think that's the case. I don't think the, the results that they found would be the case for all AI models or like all, um, all applications. But I really didn't have the numbers. And as a researcher, I really needed the evidence. And so that's when I started really looking into like the empirical factors that influence the, the carbon footprint of AI models. And what's interesting is that it was a relatively, I guess, not niche, but, you know, rel- relatively niche um, uh, application in terms of like transformers and large language models. But now it's such a, a central part of AI research that is quite interesting because I feel like, you know, they have a really big carbon footprint. They, lo- they use a lot of energy and a lot of computation just just in general. And, and yet in terms of the carbon crisis, the climate crisis, they don't have that many like useful approaches because most of the climate positive applications use supervised learning. So when you look at remote sensing, when you look at, you know, biodiversity monitoring, all these different like things that some, some of them use RL, like reinforcement learning, some of them use all sorts of stuff, but large language models, like specifically have yet to really prove um, their, their utility, I would say in terms of, of climate change. And so it's interesting because, you know, they, they have these, these bigger than the norm, like bigger than average impacts, and yet don't come with the same advantages that like even RL would come with. That feels kind of disappointing in, in lots of ways. And I, I guess another aspect of this that we'll dive into is the sort of modalities people are, are wanting to deal with, with the generative models are getting more and more expensive. I want to actually maybe put a pin in that part of things and come back to it a little bit later, but I'd love to dive into some of the specific questions that you tackle in a couple of your papers. And I think a really important question here is kind of quantification. And and I kind of maybe want to come at this from two angles, which is first, maybe a, a question to start with is how you think about quantifying emissions in general, and then how you do that for ML systems and how that kind of comes together. I mean, it was hard to, to say in general, but but I guess, well, so um, also, like at the, around the same time in 2019, um, we created this tool called Code Carbon uh, that's actually quite used. I mean, it's quite, it's, it's quite, I don't want to say popular, but yeah, people use it. And uh, the idea is really to measure the energy that's used by, um, by like a GPU or, or whatever compute cluster you're using, and then um, the source of energy, because that's really where the carbon uh, will come from in terms of energy usage. So for example, if you use hydroelectricity, um, it's relatively low carbon compared to you know coal burning electricity, which is high carbon. And so what code carbon does, it, it really quantifies that aspect of things and, and compares it to common measures and um, you know some things like miles driven in a car and things like that. Um, what, what is interesting is that since code, code Carbon came out is that the inference part of AI, I feel, is, is gaining more and more momentum. So, you know, tr- Code Carbon was kind of created for training AI models and, and quantifying that part. But in the last couple of years now, I think less people maybe are training models, and but more and more people are using them. And so it's a bit of a different paradigm in the sense of it's a lot harder to measure. And that's why it's been kind of <laughs> kind of overlooked in general is because when when you're when you're deploying AI models it's often you know distributed and there's all these scaling things and it's often you know in some cl- like hyperscale data center that's not necessarily on premise and there's all sorts of like complexities that are that make it really hard to get a tangible number of, uh, in terms of the carbon footprint of, of, of deployment specifically yeah I think one of the things that came up in, in your bloom paper as well was how in aggregate when you're having so many people doing inference and that can kind of come together to add up to something close to maybe on the same magnitude at some point, maybe even exceed the cost of training as well, right? 
Yeah, in the in the last paper I I worked on, um, I think it came out in December. Uh, so depending on the size of the language model, it was between 200 and 500 million uh, queries, which may seem like a lot, but if you're actually deploying a model like and people are actually using it, it can go quite quickly. Like after a month or two, you'd probably reach the the same amount of energy, at least that, that uh, training used. I'm wondering if we could talk a little bit about one of the, the things you talk about in your actionable items on your paper about quantifying carbon emissions has a lot to do with not just the, the training of models, and I think everybody can see the the arc of everything getting larger, data sets getting larger, training getting longer, all of this. And I think those are those are pretty clear. Where it, it seems like things are maybe a little bit more intention or there's different things shifting around is the hardware and data center aspects. And you advise people to choose cloud providers wisely, to think about the data center locations, which is a pretty important part of it. Maybe before we dig into some of the trends when it comes to hardware and how that impacts things, the data center location one is kind of interesting. And I'm wondering if you can expand about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, um, people typically, I mean, in, in my experience, people typically perceive, um, I guess, the, the the cloud compute that we used at, use as um, zero carbon. So so um, kind of like, you know, when you're training a model on Google or, or Azure or whatever, um, it's zero carbon because it's all renewable energy. Um that's not entirely true. So um, most big tech companies are, they're carbon neutral and that neutrality is based on offsets or um, renewable energy credits, which is a type of offset. So so kind of like, you know, when you take the plane and then you uh, plant a tree or whatever, it's kind of the same principle, but for energy. And so uh, what happens is that if a, if a data center is in, I don't know, say Singapore, and then the energy is mostly uh, generated based using coal, it will be offset uh, by buying renewable energy credits. And, but, you know, if you can avoid running your job in Singapore or another region with, with highly like, um, high, like carbon intensive compute, but if you can, re- if, if you can run it in say, I don't know, uh, Washington, the state of Washington that has mostly hydro powered electricity, then, you know, that um, initial energy that you're actually using even before it's offset is, is going to be uh, less bad for the planet, I guess. And so, that information wasn't um, really <laughs> readily available, let's say. Like you could, so there's like a couple of tools for this. Like there's one called Electricity Map that I really like. And you can really see, like this has become one of my thing. Every time I, I go somewhere, I travel somewhere, I try to figure out how the, how the electricity is generated. But so Electricity Map lets you actually see that on a global scale in, in, in real time. But until maybe like a year ago, um, cloud providers wouldn't really show you that information. But now, like some of them, especially like Google and, and Azure, have have started making dashboards where you can really actually see, like at the moment you're launching a job, what are the data centers that are available with the hardware you need, and you know whether they're renewable or not. So that's already like a first step, which was which is easier now than it was a couple of years ago. I think that um, what we haven't seen as much transparency um, about is the is like the embodied emissions, which we also talk about the, in the Bloom paper. So, um, so like really, like when you manufacture these GPUs, which we're using more and more of, what are the emissions of that? And that's been completely kind of <laughs> um, not. It's completely opaque. Let's say. Do you feel like? I mean, again. I think this is a kind of incentive question too. I don't know. Do do you feel like there's any movement towards making those embodied emissions a bit more transparent than they are now? Not really. I mean, there has been um there was a bill proposed in the United States um, two weeks ago now that aims to gather this information because the thing thing is is we we almost don't even know. I mean, we know like very high level orders of magnitude, but it's very high level. Like when we were writing the Bloom paper, we took some estimates that people made, but it's like it could be off by a factor of 10. Um, and so I feel like in order to make meaningful decisions and and once again, it doesn't mean like not replacing your GPU it doesn't mean like not not using as many GPUs, but just like just quantifying that like I'm a, I'm a firm believer of, you know, giving people the information they need and then letting letting them make choices if, if you know, based on whatever factors are important for them. And so I think that having that information will potentially influence the way people make these choices in AI. Um, and currently we, we're not seeing any um, any more transparency in, on, on those embodied emissions, but maybe if this bill <laughs> goes through, eventually we'll start having more numbers. And I mean, strangely enough, like there's not that many GPU manufacturers, really. <laughs> I would say there's only one major one. And so it's not like, you know, the information is 
diffused or, or like, you know, it, it, it's, it's quite centralized if, um, if there was, I guess, either the political will or, or the societal pressure to get that information, there's like a single source for it. Yeah. Diving down a little bit into the DP info question, I feel like that's one case where we talked a bit about the the information about this, but then kind of coming back to the training time, inference time questions, one of the trends that is a bit more tension in it is that we're seeing increases in, in GPU performance. We are seeing pretty much every cloud provider out there come out with their own training inference hardware that they want to claim is more efficient and that they're adapting to transformer workloads of different sorts. And so there's a good argument for that. But then at the same time, we are seeing the pull in the opposite direction. We're using more GPUs. Distributed training is going on larger and larger scales. And the same is true for the more efficient hardware that we're seeing. I'm wondering if if you have any read or, or thoughts on these two things are kind of happening in tension. And do, do you feel like there's kind of a wash in terms of one overriding the other? Do you feel like there are kind of limits when it comes to the abilities for efficient hardware to drive, you know, costs and power usage and all these things down? There's a really interesting concept in economics called the Jevons paradox. And I feel that AI is is completely living through it right now. And we don't <laughs> we don't know enough economics to really to really see this, but um, essentially, like it's been observed every time there's like kind of a, a disruptive new technology. So, for example, you know, the horse being replaced by the car, or 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 steam steamships, or or things like like electricity, things like that. But we, um, you know, we can do the same types of tasks, but more of them essentially. So, for example, we can travel more miles with a, with a car compared to a horse, right? And you would think that that comes with uh, gains in efficiency and saying, okay, well, you know, people used to travel, I don't know, whatever, 100 miles per per month on average. And, and so with a, with a car, they're going to keep traveling 100 miles, but just faster. But actually, it's not the case. People are going to start traveling 500 miles per month just because they can, because now for the same amount of time, they can go five times further. And I find that that's what was happening in AI is that, yes, we have more efficient hardware. Yes, we have more of it. You know, yes, we can do more flops, but people are going to use it more. And I, and I mean, you know, it kind of makes sense from a, also a capitalist perspective that cloud companies want you to use their, their like you say, they have a new cluster of A100s. Well, they want people to use it because they invested in making it. And so I think that we're really living through this Jevons paradox moment of AI and no, no, like, I mean, there's, there's a certain limit to Moore's law. There's a certain limit to how dense you can make uh, chips and things like that. And I think that at a certain point it will plateau, but currently we're just using AI more because we can. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Maybe coming back to the individual scientists, experimenters perspective, another kind of actionable item you present in this paper has to do with you reducing wasted resources. And, And one way this can kind of manifest is uninformative experiments, which is a little bit unfortunate from the wasted time perspective for a scientist, but then also, of course, has some impacts when it comes to carbon emissions. And I guess I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, do these considerations, like has that had an impact on your care when it comes to experiment design for your own work? Definitely. I mean, when we we were um, writing the Bloom paper about the carbon footprint of Bloom, uh, we got access to all the logs. And that was really interesting because I think that it was the first time that people really looked at them in detail and and kind of tried to figure out what portion of the compute because you know we used however many million hours GPU hours but like what portion went where and you know experimentation is is like a good half like if you take the final training it's less than half of the total GPU hours that were used and then you know there's also things like training intermediate models um, things like evaluation benchmarking so there was I mean there's a certain amount of things that were just part of the experimentation process and what's interesting is that uh, until I mean, even now, people typically only will quantify the the energy usage or the the compute of the final training run. But that kind of means that we should be uh, almost multiplying by at least a factor of two um, any of the numbers that are out there. And when it comes to my training, like I've I've started kind of having um, and I guess best practices like. Uh, Start, starting with like a small sample of the data set and, and being a lot more kind of careful about before launching a job and, and stuff like that. But of course, I'm not, I'm not training um, large scale LLMs on a daily basis. So I, I mean, there's a, the thing is with, with especially 
like big uh, language models, there's a certain part of the of the approach that's really empirical. And I, and I, and I recognize that you can't just, you know, wake up one day and then train the largest model ever without, without experimentation. So it's, it's definitely to be expected, but I do think that we have a certain brute force approach to that experimentation, like things like grid search, things like that, that could definitely be um, improved, let's say to be a bit more, um, a bit more mindful. Yeah. When it, when it comes to things like grid search, I mean, that's something I've, I've kind of employed myself and I don't know, I guess I'm wondering what sorts of specific alternatives you've thought about or maybe found that could be, you know, better than some of these strategies someone just getting into this might throw at the wall, for example. So I remember there being a, I mean, this was a paper from a couple of years ago, so I don't know if anyone's really done it for LLMs, but like they found that random search was just as, uh, like, like if you take a certain like sample, random search was, was a lot, was as efficient, sorry. I mean, it was as, um, like accurate, I guess, at the, in the end as like full on grid search and looking at all the possible combinations. The thing is with, with LLMs, I feel that, I mean, when you talk to people who have trained a lot of them, um, they do have these like intuitions. They'll be like, oh, you should start at this value or you should like explore this direction. And I feel that that's the kind of stuff that is really comes from experience. And, it, and it's, you know, people don't necessarily, uh, especially now, actually, they won't communicate that in papers. And, and so people will end up doing grid search in order to even like reproduce existing results. And that's a bit of a shame. Like uh, for a couple of years now, I've been involved with um, the reproducibility challenge and it's essentially shown that so many of the results that people publish are not reproducible. Like the vast majority are not reproducible given the information that's shared. And so there's always like this little secret sauce that people um, keep to themselves. And so, you know, I can't blame people for for using grid search in order to find uh, whatever that secret sauce is. But if we were a little bit more open, for example, and a little bit more forthcoming and sharing code and sharing actual like hyper parameters, maybe, maybe people wouldn't need to grid search. And, you know, I mean, I, I always think about this is that like, if we really kind of did a better job of, of communicating failed experiments as a community as well that, that could also save everyone a lot of effort because everyone i mean when you do these kinds of things like you you do find things that don't work and you kind of like save that in your mind right and move on but if we were a little bit better and only share and only share what worked in your paper um if we were a little bit better about sharing like oh you should avoid blah 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 learning rate or whatever for for training these kinds of models or on this kind of data i think it would really be helpful right I won't pretend I read the whole thing, but I remember when Meta released their suite of OPT models, they also released a logbook alongside it. And a lot of people were talking about how much they saw when it came to just the different ways in which these large scale experiments can fail. And, and that kind of information, as you're saying, does feel really useful. Yeah. And, and I mean, of course, the logbook is, is great. And if there were like more palatable ways of sharing that information, like, I don't know, blog posts, I feel like it's almost like a psychological thing. Like people don't want to talk about what didn't work, but for me, as I'm like, I don't know, as a as a tinkerer and as a as a scientist, as a researcher, I find that's really really interesting. That and I think that nowadays, I think I saw a workshop somewhere that was about like actually like failed experimentation and communicate. Was that something called like Lemon or something? There's like a workshop in the NLP community that's specifically about um, results that like essentially failed experiments. And I thought that was a really great idea because I would love to go to a workshop where everyone just talks about what didn't work <laughs> for for a change. Yeah, it, it does seem like the, it's it's part of a more general trend, right? I mean, everybody just wants to talk about the things that worked, the the successes and all of that. And it's, there's like the kind of countercultural thing of here's my resume of failures. Here's, you know, the things that didn't work when I ran experiments. But it doesn't seem like there is a, anything close to the kind of systematicity we see when it comes to the ways in which people will present what did work for what didn't, I guess. I, I think that at the last company I worked at where we did a lot of work on on vision and, and things like this, there was one other engineer at my company on my team who did a really good presentation about some of the work he was doing on, I think, 3D segmentation. And actually, his project kind of came up with a negative result of like, this actually doesn't work very well for our hardware. And it kind of turned into this long logbook of all the things he did that didn't work. And I think that was maybe the only time working at that company or, or since that I've seen somebody do something like that. And it was, it was really good. Like it was systematic. And I, I feel like we just don't, right. I, th I think as you're saying, we just don't do that kind of thing enough.
Exactly. Yeah. There's really this like selective disclosure. And I mean, I'm not blaming anyone. It's just kind of the way science works almost. You like focus on, and plus like imagine, especially in, in machine learning, which is like a relatively recent field. Can you imagine like the field of possibilities of, of things that we could have tried? And then say we only communicate the ones that w did work. But I mean, like that means that there's this whole, it's like, it's like holding like a small flashlight in like this dark room, but there's the rest of the room that we're not seeing and not like like honestly, like especially if I talk to people who have been doing this for a while, like I, I um I did my my postdoc with Joshua Bengio and he's been around since the beginning, I guess. Um and like sometimes he's like, Oh yeah, you you should try this or or like, yeah, I don't think that I don't think that's worth looking into. And it and he can and he, it's just like an intuition. It's just like something that he's picked up on, right? But that's not necessarily very quantifiable and people probably don't know. The the intuition aspect is is really hard, I feel. I think as you you were talking about people who have spent a lot of time training LLMs also having this kind of intuition when it comes to numbers for models. And it's it's maybe not always that, well, well, if it's just like you should try this number, that's something you can kind of write down. But I feel like the full thought process, it's, it's like weird to communicate these things because I feel like also in general, as people were not always convinced by things without reasons for them a lot of the time. And so somebody comes to you and they say, this isn't going to work, whether it's a big project or a, a choice of hyperparameters you have for an experiment and you ask them why and they're just like, oh, you know, I just like, I've seen this, I have intuitions. I feel like that's not always going to stop people from trying it and failing anyway. Yeah. And uh, especially nowadays, like, I feel that, I mean, I don't know, um, maybe in other fields, it's kind of similar, but we have a pretty low acceptance rate. And I know a lot of people who like will try to get to publish a, something in a journal and, and try again and then you know end up giving up or whatever. And so there's also all this information that just kind of like doesn't come through because it's kind of like a fail, quote unquote. And so it's, I always find that it's a bit of a shame because, you know, people also won't put things up on open review if they have very critical reviews and, and things like that. And so that also means that, you know, say like, what's the acceptance rate between 10 and 15% that there's like 85 to 90% of research that hopefully will come out at some point, but sometimes just kind of disappears into the ether. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, I, I want to come back to, I guess, some of your work on, again, kind of carbon emissions and stuff, sort of bringing back the, the main thread of the conversation. And you have another really interesting paper that goes into power hungry processing, looking at like what's driving AI development costs. And we, we've touched on a couple of the things in here. And I guess like what's really important about this paper is you're proposing like the first systematic comparison of ongoing inference costs for different sorts of ML systems. And we talked about how this is kind of different. And one thing you brought up earlier is how these generative models are not super helpful when it comes to carbon things. But then another thing that's pointed out in this paper is that even when you control for the number of model parameters and maybe the task that you're working with, these things are orders of magnitude more expensive from this perspective than a task-specific system. You know, I, I, I think I'm, I'm kind of wondering at this point, so I, I released a, an episode of this podcast pretty recently with somebody who had very strong opinions that we should not be trying to build AGI and he would much prefer we just build task-specific architectures. And I thought that was a very interesting thought. And I don't feel like I hear a lot of people voicing this. I'm wondering if, I don't know how like you would justify this or if you think about it in the same way at all, but I'm curious if from that carbon perspective, if that pushes you towards one way or another on, on that kind of thought. I mean, having worked in applied, like actual, like you need to create things that will fly in production type AI or, or AI machine learning. Um, I don't think that you can really create a one size fits all anything. Um, and of course, like there's going to be a really long kind of trailing, you know, the long tail distribution. But but it, I think that in in most uh, domains I can think of and most applications I can think of, it's really important to have task specific, task specific data. Like I remember when I started working at Morgan Stanley, I learned that like the same words um, that I, you know, things like, I don't know, dove and bear and all these things have actual meanings in finance. They didn't know. So, I mean, things like that, I feel that in general, I think from a, from like a practical perspective, I think that um, task specific or context specific models definitely makes more sense. I mean, in research, I understand the like the Swiss army knife idea of you wanting to make something that works for as many potential use cases as possible. But I think that when it comes down to production, a lot of people will will need a level of specificity that 
general models can't deliver. And um, from a carbon and energy perspective, like I, I mean, when you think about computation in general, right? Like a lot of the most recent LLM specifically, well, even multimodal like image generation models use so much compute. <laughs> it's actually pretty, pretty. Um, uh, crazy and a lot of people don't have access to whatever 16 GPUs and and things like that and so um, I wanted to quantify that and not necessarily once again to say you shouldn't do this but just so people know you know when they're making this trade-off from for example a model like a fine-tuned BERT model that was trained for specific or fine-tuned specifically for sentiment analysis right compared to like some T5 derivative model that can do this kind of from a, in a zero shot way. Just I wanted to show that from the same for the same task, even for a similar performance, um, there is a really big difference in terms of compute and energy. And I think that that's what the study really helped bring home is that like these a lot of these models can do the same task, but it's just a matter of how much compute you'll need you'll need to use for for the the zero shot, like the the more general models. Um, and also, like, I think from a practical perspective, there are very few use cases where you need to do all the tasks. Like, usually it's like either, you know, finding information or, um, I don't know, whatever, answering questions or uh, classifying customer reviews or whatever. But it's always, it's like it rarely has to be everything um, <laughs> in the whole wide world kind of thing. And so, um, so yeah, that was like another kind of uh, intuition that, we try to communicate in that in that article. That makes a lot of sense to me. One, I feel like I have a couple of different directions I want to ask about here. One of them, I suppose, is a really big part of the carbon emissions we see in, in general systems is the fact that the transformer architecture is like not super efficient when it comes to, to computational costs. And one direction that a lot of people want to dive into is things like state space models or maybe less, um, just, just more efficient architectures that would also be more power efficient. And I'm wondering if that's like, do you, do you think diving into that direction? My, my presupposition here is that if those actually worked out, and I think that a lot of work and experimentation is going to have to happen for us to figure that out. But if you instead build general purpose architectures on a base like that, that is a lot more efficient, that doesn't scale quadratically with sequence length and so on, I'm wondering, you know, it feels like that would mitigate things quite substantially, but I don't know if it would kind of drive it down to the point where I would imagine the trade-off kind of looks sort of different, but I'm wondering if that's something you think about as well. I think transformers were initially designed to be general purpose uh, or yeah. quite general purpose. And so I think it's kind of the, you know, if you multiply, if you if you expand upon something uh, that was not meant to be specific. And actually that's why, why they became my part of the reason why they became so popular, right? Is because they could be used for all these different tasks. And so I think that, yeah, we're, we keep using transformer architecture. And of course, we kind of inevitably just multiply that and make very big, very um, you know, general or, or, or relatively general te technologies, but that are inherently inefficient because of the way that they're they're created. And so I think that I, I agree that we should go back to the drawing board, but I think going back to the drawing board might entail being okay with the idea that these are not going to be general general purpose technologies, which I think people are quite <laughs> attached to nowadays. So it's like they're going to keep using transformers because they're general purpose be, to create general purpose technologies. And so um, I don't see people really questioning <laughs> the transformer, um, like the benefits of transformer models for now. But maybe at, at a certain point, we're going to collectively decide that we should start not not put all our eggs in one basket, let's say. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense to me. One of like the, the really interesting, I think, details that came up in your paper when you were looking at like differences between the different multipurpose architectures you look at is you kind of compare sequence to sequence architectures or models with decoder only ones. And I think you found that when you compare models of the same size, sequence to sequence models were more efficient than decoder only counterparts. And that's really interesting because I think that kind of coming back to what we're just talking about with the different ways that you can build these sorts of systems with sequence to sequence and their attention mechanism that kind of functions differently from decoder only models in terms of like what is being attended to. And that's just like a really interesting insight because again, you know, we're looking at like what is the the algorithmic construction of this model and then how does that have the downstream impact on the actual carbon consumption. And I guess I'm wondering in general if you have thoughts on 
just the, again, we talked about like in very broad strokes, the types of directions that might be helpful for building models that are more power efficient. But like if there are specific sorts of directions that you're thinking about in terms of architectures, you would like to see people use more of, less of. Um, again, I know that you're kind of not trying to be super norm- normative about this and want people to like know things and make those decisions. But just in terms of things you've thought about on that front, I'm very curious. I think it's really hard to say like we should pursue these these ar- this or this architecture, but I do think people should be more um, aware of like there's all these kind of not tips and tricks, but kind of tips and tricks that people use to make models more efficient. Things from like, yeah, distillation and pruning, but also like um, reducing the number of like floating points. And there's all sorts of stuff like when you talk to people who really kind of have resource constrained deployment in, in their mind like because they're working in like a smart a smaller startup and things like that like they have all sorts of techniques that they'll use and a lot of them are really interesting and actually the follow up paper that I'm working on now because like the um, power hungry processing paper was really kind of meant to kind of draw a line in the sand and say okay this is kind of like a general comparison but now I want to really go into detail about like what people can do and I think that depending once again on the on the on the task that you're doing depending on you know the constraints of deployment the hardware and, and stuff like that there are lots of kind of smaller yeah I guess engineering hacks that can be done and I I'm curious to see whether like for each type of architecture there are the same or, or maybe different um, hacks that we can look into and so that's kind of line of work I'm pursuing because I don't think you can tell people like use sequence to sequence use decoder only like doesn't work but I I do think that like we're not we're not like utilizing the compute we have in a very like um like we're not maximally utilizing it actually like people like will deploy models and they won't necessarily like try all the steps in order to make the models like more efficient yeah that's that's very fair and I think when it comes to numbers that we look at like hardware utilization and and that sort of thing too that's another thing where like when you look at different sorts of power efficient architectures people are trying to put out like the the peak utilization that we get on those is, is not anywhere close to i think like the theoretical max or where we want to be and i think that people are throwing things at the wall and there's lots of like different optimizations that are going on to to make that happen but we're still like very very far away from actually really this hardware is supposed to be more efficient, but are we leveraging that in as much as we possibly can? Yeah, exactly. When we did the Bloom paper, what was interesting is that we did this case study of like it was the the model was um, essentially deployed on a Google Cloud instance, and then I I ran Code Carbon on that instance for like something like three weeks. And what was interesting is that it wasn't like an it wasn't like a simulation; it was an actual model being deployed, and then you could see that for like the majority of the time the model wasn't being queried, but there was still energy utilization and then they would have these peaks. And, you know, usually what people do in production, they also have all sorts of like Kubernetes stuff and elastic, you know, powering up instances and stuff like that. But, you know, it's not a very efficient use of the GPU to begin with because a lot of the time is just waiting for, for queries. Maybe a good place to kind of close up and summarize before we move to some of the really interesting responsible AI papers you have is, in you're estimating the carbon footprint of Bloom paper, one of the things that comes up is you're adopting this life cycle assessment methodology to cover all of the stages of the life cycle of a product and kind of applying that to ML systems. And maybe as a, a good kind of summary of this section in terms of the information that's sort of important for somebody to be looking at when they're thinking about these carbon impacts, could you go over a little bit about that methodology and, and the sort of information you, you see as most important there? Yeah, the life cycle assessment was was interesting because when I talked to people who were really like in the environmental science side of things, they were like, well, you know, what are the steps of the life cycle? Like, Because they really have this like cradle to the grave methodology, like anything that you buy or consume, right, whether it be like a pair of jeans or, or, or a pen or whatnot, they have a cradle to the grave kind of life cycle analysis that, that can be done, everything from like the raw materials to the disposal of the object. And they're like, so for an AI model or like an LLM, what would that look like? And I was like, that's a great question. And it's really actually pretty hard. But what we defined was uh, starting with kind of the raw material extraction to the actual making of the GPU. So like the, the manufacturing, the embodied emissions, then you have the training, then you have the deployment. And then in terms of like end of life, I don't know, it's, it's, it's kind of tricky because even storing a model actually comes with you know, some maybe marginal footprint, but but at least, you know, there is a life cycle um, and we're missing information for a lot of parts of that life cycle. I would say that the manufacturing, like the embodied emissions are the biggest kind of like, for me, unknown ver- variable in all that, but also kind of the scale 
of deployment. I know that often when I talk to kind of people from the general public about deploying AI, they're like, okay, well, like, you know, ballpark figure, uh, you know, and, I, and there's even like, apart from like the number of daily, whatever people using chat GPT, like we don't really have a good idea of how widespread AI deployment is. And as we're switching from say more supervised learning approaches to generative approaches, given that that's going to come with a more compute cost, uh, probably, um, I think it's really important to, to get, to get a better grasp of that. Cause people are like, Oh, well, it's not as bad as crypto. No, it's not as bad as crypto, but you know, maybe it's also less niche than crypto. Cause I mean, like now, like every time we do a Google search, every time we, you know, navigate from point A to point B, every time we like get an ad that's served up to us, that's all like, that's all using AI. Right. But we don't really have any of those numbers. And I personally find that that pretty frustrating because it's like nowadays, almost everything we do on the internet is going to have some form of AI baked into it. And and yet we don't really have like the, the energy costs or the carbon emissions associated with all that. Yeah, the, the ubiquity is a really, really important aspect of that. I think it's maybe a good place to begin diving into some of your responsible AI work. And the place I want to begin is you had this really great stable bias paper. And we talked about different aspects of text image models when it comes to carbon emissions. But then another thing that kind of goes on with these is they can reinforce lots of societal biases. And, you know, when you input, maybe you're looking for, you have a prompt and you're looking for somebody of a specific profession, for example, like CEO, then certain demographics are going to be more represented in the outputs and other demographics. I guess at a kind of a broad level too, though, when it comes to like the, the distribution of races and ethnicities and, and genders you might see when it comes to certain things. But a- another aspect of this too is the more and more specific you get with your prompts, these models will also give you like exactly what you want. So when you do go ahead and, and specify the ethnicity and things like that, if you leave, I guess, certain dimensions of your output kind of open, then the model can like reinforce those biases. But then like when you make your prompt more and more specific, it does get like more and more exactly what you want. And so I think that, I, I guess I'm kind of wondering, you know, how you think about when it comes to um, some of the problematic aspects of this and, and sort of using these models in production and people creating things with them, I would imagine, you know, maybe if you're a kid beginning to use one of these models or something, you're not maybe going to have that in mind of this is how this model functions and this is how I should be prompting it to get the things that I'm looking for. And that's kind of a, a one venue for reinforcement. But I'm wondering kind of with that in mind, the angle of like this thing gives you exactly what you're looking for kind of deal, how you think about the representativeness questions and, and some of these things. I mean, it's, it's a really interesting question. There have been a couple of studies about this. There's one that's like, there's a paper about CLIP, the CLIP model, and essentially um, shows that if you don't really um, put any of these specifics, that it defaults to white and male which is really interesting. And I mean, I kind of, so the stable bias paper came from that idea of trying to quantify these biases. It's like, if you don't provide demographic information, what happens? And then interestingly, we found that not only it's kind of what you expect is kind of worse. It's kind of like amplifying the existing biases that people tend to have. Like, okay, well, you know, CEOs are mostly white and male, but not all white and male. But actually when you use um, whatever, Stable Diffusion or Dolly to generate images of CEOs, they will all be white and male wearing suits and glasses. And so it was really interesting because it's really, it's not even like the fact that it, it it's like what you'd expect. It's just that it kind of like validates the stereotype in a certain way. And um I guess that was the more uh, worry, worrisome um, discovery that we made. But also, um, I mean, that's just like the lack of diversity in general. Like you can't always be expected to be like, oh, well, for example, say you do want like images of CEOs for some ad campaign or, or, or whatever for a website, right? You, It's really hard to expect people to be like a oh, black female CEO with a red shirt and, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know, an East Asian like, I mean, like you, you can't, I mean, you, I guess it, it, it depends on how much like pressure you want to put on people, but I, I find that it's a bit unrealistic to expect them to have to list out all the characteristics when they're prompting these models. Um, and by default, if you just say CEOs, they're all going to be the same or, or very close to. So actually it's what's really interesting is that um, like there was this one uh, like kind of by bi- uh, like diversity um, 
like a, I guess it was like a fix that 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 OpenAI did when they when they uh, launched Dolly Two was was like appending uh, terms like 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 gender and, and race terms to people's prompts in order to actually like kind of artificially add diversity to the outputs. And so I mean that's one way of doing it, right? But it still goes to show that the, like the underlying models themselves don't necessarily like encode any kind of diversity. And honestly, like you can't really blame. <laughs> I, it, like the, once again, like the technology itself, it's it, it, it's made to like hone in on dominant patterns, right? Like uh, this has been a, this thing, like machine learning is good at the the norm or like what's around the like the the, the median, right? And as soon as you start like uh, having either like uh, imbalanced data or like niche edge cases and things like that, it, it typically isn't as good as for something that's close to the center. And, and it's the same thing for, for diffusion models. I mean, they're not any different. They're good at, you know, representing things that have been a lot in the training data have been like heavily present in the training data. And then if you start asking for you know, uh, the generation of images that are not necessarily, like, who's even, like, component parts, right? Like, if, like, a certain country or demographic was 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 underrepresented in the data, like, typically they won't be as well represented by the model. And, and it's kind of, like, it's kind of obvious, I guess, when you, if you think about, like, the actual way the models work. But then when you start um, playing around with them and generating uh, outputs, then you're like, okay, well, this intrinsic property of the model actually translates to like real world stereotypes. And for example, we saw people um, created this like wrapper for the Dolly 2 API that was for for generating forensic sketches. And for me, that was like the most eye opening example of like how, once again, the intrinsic property of a model can really directly translate into real world, world harms if people are using it in a in like a criminal like a justice setting where they're like oh yeah like uh, it's a criminal right like what will Dolly to output as the image of a dangerous criminal and so um it's, yeah so so kind of that it it's all it's all linked in that sense i'm wondering if you can dive into a little bit of the the technical angle here of your in this paper you're sort of also looking into figuring out some of these questions around in which directions are these models biased? What does the representativeness look like when you leave some of these parameters of gender or ethnicity open, for example? And so how did you kind of think about approaching figuring that out? It was really interesting when we started that study. I, I reached out to a lot of people who I really respect work in AI ethics. I talked to Alex Hanna. I talked to people who have been thinking about this problem for a lot for a while. And I was like, well, how like we want to study this, but we want to do it properly and we want to do it like and then um what people had done in another study was that like they ran another kind of classifier, like machine learning classifier on the output images and and said, okay, well, you know, these are 33%, you know, white male and 35%, whatever. And so they actually like assign these labels based on another classifier. And then, for example, Alex was really like, but like these, these images do not have any inherent nor race nor gender. Like these are just kind of like uh, generated artifacts, right? So you can't really assign these characteristics to them. And that really made me think. And, and also about the fact that like gender isn't binary, which is, you know, which are things I know, but you know, it's, it's kind of like the, <laughs> it's kind of like the go-to thing. It's like, oh, you're using, you're doing ML. Well, maybe there's like a model that's been trained to do exactly what you want to do. And so let's just use this model, right? It's kind of what, what we do a lot. And so I had to really question that assumption. And then she was like, well, well, maybe you can, you know, try to cluster them or try to find similarities or try to find similar characteristics, but it doesn't necessarily even have to be like demographic. It could just be like, for example, the fact that firefighters are often wearing red clothing or nurses are wearing blue scrubs or, or whatnot, right? Like often there's these characteristics that you won't be able to find if you're just using like a, like a classifier that has pre, um, predefined categories. And so what we did, we ended up doing is, is we did clustering based on the, just like the, the actual like visual characteristics of the images. And we also did, um, a couple of image to text models that were just like freely um, describing the images. And that was really interesting because depending on the model we used and they're all biased as well, but like the descriptions were different as well. And you could get like, instead of having just like, you know, white male, you would have like, an, like a phrase that you can then, like we did all sorts of analyses to find what like the salient, like, or the, what, at least the, um, the most common uh, words were to describe a certain profession based on different image to text models. And I thought that was interesting because it's like, you're not saying that this is a white man, but this is like an image of these characteristics, like according to these different models. Yeah. And you tackled that in two ways in this paper, right? I remember you used two different types of systems. One was like an image captioning system. And so 
you're looking for these uh, longer descriptions, multi-word captions, whereas for your visual question answering system, I think you used, you were asking it for what is like a, a single word or a phrase or something that describes this picture, right? Exactly. Yeah. We tried to keep it open-ended instead of having like it defined by a couple of categories. Could you talk a little bit about, I guess, the the impacts that those two different flavors of textual description had when it came to the the kind of clusterings and sort of what sort of insights you got out of them? We found a lot of interesting things like about the fact that um, certain professions were really like, uh, I guess, uh, heavily represented by like a certain color. Like, yeah, like firefighters are red. And I think it was like pol- police was yellow. Something was yellow. Like we had these really like Uh, color specific discoveries and also um, like we found these like very stereotypical representations of certain um, demographic groups like Native Americans what was really interesting is that like no no matter the prompt all it almost uh, Native Americans were were depicted with like kind of cultural uh, headdresses and things like that which obviously are not are not always worn right and so we found like these I guess specifically for demographics that were underrepresented in the data, we had these like very like what what you can say like white person at work or like white woman at work. And you would have all these different kind of contexts and backgrounds. One would be an office and then it would be kind of like, I don't know, it's like bookshelves and you would have all sorts of things. And if you say Native American person at work, they were all kind of like just wearing headdresses or kind of these very like cultural, um, cultural wear. And it was I mean, we found and things like that. And then, and then for certain professions, like all of them were wearing glasses <laughs> or like for certain professions, all of them would have ties uh, or be in front of a computer and things like that. And that was really interesting. Like looking at the most frequent term per profession, it was actually like a lot of the cases, it was really salient. It was like, yeah, I say it was like CEOs, uh, something like suit and like computer programmer. It was like laptop and, and that really made a lot of sense. Right. And so, yeah, it was really interesting analysis. And I find that as a kind of a byproduct of this project, we made a lot of interesting uh, user facing tools that uh, people really liked using. And my favorite one was like the average face tool, which like for a given profession and and, like different models will distill uh, all of the faces into like a single one. And it really shows that like from the 500 images or however many that like Dolly 2 generated of janitors, there was a specific kind of like type of, of per, or, or person or appearance that was generated. And I felt that that distillation was really powerful as well. Another aspect of this that you bring up in your future work section is that a lot of the, the attributes we've talked about, you can, you can see them from images, firefighters wearing red clothing, things like this. But there's also a lot of attributes that one might want to understand and characterize when it comes to biases or predispositions that really can't be inferred visually. And you do propose that as kind of an open avenue for future work, but I'm wondering if you have kind of thoughts on progress that can be made in that direction specifically. I honestly feel that a lot of the quote unquote like disruptions or innovations that were made by um, machine learning tools recently have been kind of UI because like when the chat GPT UI came out, people started using it more and it was, I mean, the model itself was great as well, but I mean, it was just like the fact that it was so easy to use and you didn't need your own hardware and et cetera, et cetera. So I definitely think that in order to make these tools more, more useful and, but also like not necessarily just for indiscriminate like usage, but also for a better understanding of them, we need better UIs. And that's why I'm a, I'm a huge fan of like the spaces section of, of hugging face and the fact that it's so easy to make like something, even if it's just like you have a classifier and you want people to drag and drop images and use your classifier, like you don't need to know JavaScript to do that. And uh, I I firmly believe that the more non-technical people will have access to these tools and and break break these models or or find edge cases and and find failure modes, the more powerful and more robust that the models themselves will become. Yeah. I know we're kind of starting to run up against time here. So maybe a last paper for us to discuss was the one I wanted to make sure I touched on. So you were a co-author on this really interesting paper about meta-ethical perspectives on benchmarking AI ethics. And I found this super, super important because it's sort of a lingering question, like how, quote unquote, ethical is is a system? And that's something that people would naturally want to subject to measurement. And I think that many of us who are kind of trained in computer science and, you know, who have taken classes like algorithms, there's that bent towards wanting to quantify things, towards approaching them from a specific angle. And that can kind of sometimes lead us astray in certain ways. Uh, And I think that's something that's been talked about a lot when it comes to the the socio-technical angles on these things. 
But I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about you. You you sort of take this paper and you you and your co-authors sort of draw on different considerations from moral philosophy and metaethics, and you argue that it's basically impossible to develop a benchmark to measure the ethicality of an AI system. And I guess I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about the that difficulty of like developing a moral benchmark for AI systems and kind of the direction you want to push people in instead. I mean, yeah, it, and there's no one size fits all solution to ethics. And I think that could be really frustrating for people. And especially because uh, AI technologies are supposed to be as usable for most people as possible. So people t- tend to be like, we want our self-driving car to, you know, to be ethical, but there's not, or moral. Um, there's really no one size fits all solution to that. And it's even hard to quantify things like values or morals. Like you can't really test these kinds of things. And and often if you test them in a certain context or, or setup, they won't actually, um, like people won't actually act that way in real life. Right. And so I think that like, we're trying to we're trying to be very uh, empirical about these things, but when it comes to moral philosophy and philosophy in general, like literal centuries of research have shown that it's, it's very complex and it's really, really hard to boil it down to even even data. Even if you had all the data, it wouldn't necessarily be enough. It wouldn't necessarily really show you what, what people's like moral values are. So I feel that in that part paper, we tried to really communicate that it's not like trying to adopt that perspective of like trying to quantify ethics is, is kind of a dead end solution. And you kind of suggest that people dive into or sort of look at this from an angle of, of values instead. And I thought it was kind of interesting because you bring up emotivism in this paper. And that made me think about like Alistair McIntyre has that very famous book After Virtue in which he talks a, a lot about emotivism as a way that people are approaching morality. And he has a lot of troubles with this and kind of argues for something like a return to virtue ethics, which was, it felt like a little bit of an interesting parallel, because you are looking at, well, let's actually make explicit and interrogate the values that get encoded in AI research and the systems we're building, and kind of lay those out. Because when we just use these super broad terms like ethical, we're, you know, we, we have these sort of normative presuppositions that are tied up in that, and we're not reflecting on those when we just use these broad terms. And so for somebody who is looking to better reflect on what does it look like for a system to be, you know, ethical in like a non-broad way. I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about what that concretely maybe looks like for somebody. I think that um, there's, it's really hard to say ethical broadly, but you can really say like in a given context, right? If this tool is used for this particular application um, and uh, validate, or like the output is validated by humans, it can really kind of put, um, limitations to whether something is ethical or not but like there's like even like stable diffusion it's it's biased but we're all biased right like so it's it's biased in a in a way that's different than my bias which is why i see it as biased and and some people are like oh well you know all ceos are white and male what's the problem and so it's it's really like it's really hard to talk about bias or or ethics in a very um universal or, or all encompassing way but i do think it's really important to quantify and test and evaluate and communicate like failure cases you can't just be like oh our model is safe you have to be like well our model is safe and here are some like use cases we tested and here are some failure modes that we found and then you know here are some biases we identified and then at least people will be aware of that and and also this model should never be used for x y and z right because we haven't tested it for that and whereas if people are like well this is like a general purpose model and it's safe and robust and ethical then of course people will think it can be used for everything and anything and that's i don't think i don't think that's ever the case honestly <laughs> There's an important argument, I think, that's coming out in what you're saying about the the verbiage we use to describe these systems. One thing that came up in another conversation with somebody I had was about they they sometimes, you know, we often throw around these terms like reasoning when we describe LLMs, for instance. And that's a, a pretty vague, broad term, and people have lots of issues with using it, but it gets kind of deployed anyway. And I, I guess there's maybe an argument here for trying to like use these broad terms like ethics, like reasoning a little bit less. And when we're talking about these systems, just say what you mean, like be kind of specific about what are the capabilities, the limitations when we're describing biases, like what's the data here and what is this actually doing? Yeah, definitely. And I feel that we've gotten less and less transparent with, uh, especially like in, in, this, in the recent year, because it's become such a kind of like a, marketing and like a PR kind of driven field that we've, we've 
been less transparent, just like less, I guess, I mean, before people would, would publish a paper and it was kind of a research artifact. So you would give more information. It would be like a really important part of like the actual publication process. And now it's like, well, you launch a model and you just say it's like great and you can do this task. And then you don't necessarily go into all of the details of all of the hyperparameters because it's supposed to be a product. And that really worries me because I feel that there's a lot of things that are going by unnoticed just because, I mean, it's it's kind of, once again, it's normal for companies to, to focus on the benefits of their products. But I do feel that scientifically, we should also be communicating about the, the shortcomings or, or the limitations. Agreed. Maybe maybe a final question for us to close out here is you're somebody who I think has thought really carefully about kind of the, the impact you want to have with your research and, and the different directions you want to take. And I guess it's a really interesting time for anybody to be in this field right now. And a lot of people, I think many PhD students, for instance, are kind of confronting these like existential questions of, is Google or OpenAI going to come along with something that makes my entire you know research direction obsolete in a couple of years or, or something of that sort? And I think people kind of come at this from different directions. And a lot of you know senior researchers, I find very encouraging on this front. But I, I guess I'm wondering, you know, for somebody listening to this, somebody who's maybe a little bit earlier in their research career than you, what advice you have on pursuing different research directions and things like that in, in the midst of everything we're seeing right now? I think it's important to stay focused on like interests and not necessarily what's like a dominant research direction. So maybe everyone's trying to work on LLMs these days, but I, it, it is a passing fad and it can be frustrating, but inexorably we're going to go back. I mean, we're going to diversify more or, or I think people are still working on a lot of diverse things. They're just not getting the same amount of attention that people working on LLMs are. So I, I definitely think it's important because, you know, it's, it's important for scientists, researchers, whatever practitioners to be passionate about their work. And, um, you know, I, I see a lot of people being like, okay, I'm going to do my PhD on LLMs just because I feel like I have to. And I really kind of disagree with that. I think that it's, especially when you're doing a, a PhD or a graduate degree or whatever, it's really important to be <laughs> very passionate about what you do because it's a, it could be a long journey. Um, and then also like it, not being kind of hesitant to explore that more societal aspect of things, like to think about the consequences of your work. And even if it's just like a paragraph in a paper, but just to kind of try to anticipate it and communicate because often, you know, as someone who's developed, for example, a new approach or a model, people will look up to you and be like, okay, well, you came up with this, this thing. And, you know, if you, if you kind of get ahead of it and be like, okay, well, this is the way I intended my tool to be used or my model to be used. Even if other people use it differently, at least you kind of had that kind of, you know, forward thinking approach. And I think that's really important. Like, I know people hate broader impact statements or whatever. And, it can be a pain in the butt, but on the other hand, it makes you think a little bit about about this technology because you can't really practice AI in the, in a in a in a vacuum. It, it it has connections to society, and maybe it's not going to be like right away, but somewhere, sometime, can someone can use a something you can come up with, and then it will have an impact on on a, like a group. And so it's really important to kind of think that through before before you know <laughs> publishing your baby out into the world. That's a really great message and I think a, a good place to end too. Uh, Sasha, thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I, I admire your work a lot and appreciate your taking the time to speak with me about it. Sure. Uh, it was really nice to talk to you too. And um, yeah, I hope to cross paths again. Thank you for listening to The Gradient. Thanks to my guest, Sasha Lucioni. Don't forget to leave ratings if you like this and I'll see you next week.